we're going to start with Ryan O'Halloran, and uh, after that will be Jennifer. Okay, perfect. Hey, John, Ryan O'Halloran from the Denver Post. Uh, two Bronco questions for you. What are your memories of the decision to sign with the team uh, way back when? And also, how did watching Mike Shanahan run an organization set a foundation for how you do it now? Yeah, good questions. Um, you know, first of all, in signing with, um, with Denver, um, you know, I, I, I'm really grateful to, uh, to Linda, my wife, um, because there were so many different dynamics. Um, and, you know, at that point, we had started a family and you just want things perfect with your family. You want, you know, and I think that's kind of how I was embarking on that search uh, with that in mind more than anything. And there, were, there came a point where I had numerous teams involved and she kind of just gave me the permission. She said, look, John, we're going to be happy wherever we are so long as we are together, make this decision for the right reasons in terms of football, because we'll be fine. You know, you send us to Siberia and we're going to be all right. So as long as we're together and, uh, you know, and, and then in Denver, it was just, uh, it was just a tremendous fit. And um, I think uh, I had a connection with Mike. I had met him over at the, at the, uh, at the Pro Bowl one year. And uh, it was actually after the Pro Bowl, I was on another Island. He was there with Peggy and, um, some friends and I was playing with my kids in the sand and he came up and we just spent some time on that trip and I had great admiration uh, for the way that the uh, that the Broncos were run as an organization those things travel and uh, there was a the reputation that they were going to give you a chance every year and that's all you can ask for in this league and and um, I liked where the team was at you know when when I got there and um you know, I, I, those were four great years. I'm very grateful to the Broncos organization. Ended up uh, living there long beyond that. That was really going to be our home. My, my, uh, my mother-in-law ended up getting sick and it was a terminal illness. So we came back to San Diego. But otherwise, I think we'd still be living in Denver. Uh, you see me smiling? Yeah, so. Um, Sit in the car. Like you yeah, um, there's that. The second question, Ryan. Uh, uh, playing for Mike, you know, he ran the organization when, when you were here. How much did that set a foundation for how you do it now in San Francisco? Yeah, well, I think a lot of what Mike believes in and, and uh, you know, goes back to, to Bill Walsh on how you run an organization, doing things first class. So much of the foundation of how he ran it were things that he picked up, um, you know, coaching for the Niners. And so I think um, in inherently I, I think that's kind of what drew me to the Niners this this idea of a place um, that had multiple championships but there was a blueprint um, as to how you go about it and so I definitely do think there's a connection obviously I'm coaching with his son I think that's been talked about at great length um, uh, you know that's that's really not how Kyle and I connected through his dad but I'm sure it helped and um, you know I, I'm, I'm really grateful um, you know uh, that, uh, that the Broncos were there for me at that stage in my career. I had played 11 years in Tampa and the thought of going anywhere else was really hard to digest. And they, they gave me a really nice landing spot. You know, my only, um, regret is that we, we, we knocked on the door, you know, being in that championship game in 05, but champ and I, and that group, Al Wilson, we talk about it often that, you know, we kind of let one get away right there, but my only regret is not, not having won a championship, but we, I gave it everything I had and, and Denver became, and will always be a special place in my heart and, my, and that of my families as well. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, Jennifer and then uh, Mike Cliff. Hey, John, congratulations again. Thank you, Jennifer. Tom Flores just spoke about the roller coaster, about how he thought he was going to get in and then he didn't. He kind of had skepticism. Can you share with us kind of the ride of, you know, going through the, the nomination process and then finally actually being named to the Hall of Fame and how it actually has hit you? Yeah, um, it, it's, a, it's a strange thing as a, as a competitor. Um, there's a strange dynamic to it because I think everything you're involved in, you feel like you have some say in the matter. You go compete for something. You can't compete for this. Uh, you know, I think the resume that you put forth is what you did, what I did for 15 years. And so by the time it gets to the voters, it's not like you can go have one more performance to, to convince them. It, that, that's kind of, you know, it's, it, it's there and there's not a, 
uh, a whole lot you can do. So I really tried to have tr uh, great perspective. And, and every time that I made a semifinalist, that I met a finalist, those weren't just hollow words. Those, those, that was sincere sincerity when I'd say how humbled I was because you all you have to do is look at the other people on that list and you, you realize the company that you're in. I think where it got hard, Jennifer, is certain years, um, you know, that the committee does a tremendous job of keeping what's said in that room um, sacred. And they should as well. They should, but I think when you've been a finalist so many times, uh, you know, some people will offer opinions and say, "Hey, I think this is your year." I've I've canvassed the the committee, and and you know, one year I think I think two years before it happened, that I, it seemed to be this pervasive thought that it was happening, and then it didn't, and so that gets you a little. But I really do believe, and I'll talk about this during my speech. I think. Um, you know, I, I really do believe things happen when they're supposed to. And the way this all came together um, in, a, in a COVID year um, where David Baker could come to your house every other year, it was Linda and I, which was great. And it would have been tremendous receiving the news in, in a hotel room. Um, but this year I was, we were here in my house in San Diego and my entire family was here and a lot of close friends and um, they did a great job of keeping it quiet. I was completely surprised and, and, I think uh, that just made it made it feel like it happened right on time uh, to, to be able to share it with so many of my of my loved ones, and it, it really made it special. What was the event that they kind of tricked you into believing you were going to? Or well, we were heading up north. Um, you know, it was our last day down uh, in uh, in San Diego, and it was championship weekend, and so we did what we normally do. Um, we went to mass and it wasn't unusual then that if we're in San Diego going to mass that both families, my family, Linda's family, would, would come over to the house. And uh, so we came over to the house and had some neighbors that stopped by and, and, uh, and, and the championship games were on. So we were watching the AFC and NFC championships getting ready for that. And, um, you know, I, there were some signs looking back, Linda was acting a little strange <laughs> and, uh, you know, buying, buying a bunch of, uh, of new plants for our house when we were heading back up north for a good so I, I didn't quite get that but i i just thought we were entertaining she's a perfectionist she wanted things right and so i just kind of went with it and uh you know um then heard this loud knock and i i did think that's the first time i had an inkling something was wrong because i told one of the kids i was getting ready i was I had my seat ready to watch the games and heard this loud knock and I told, I think my youngest daughter, Leah, Leah, could you go get that? And they said, no, dad, you have to go get the door. And then as I went to the door, everyone followed me. <laughs> and so it just kept getting stranger. So I, I, I was like, something's going on, but I, I was obviously floored as per the reaction when, when David showed up at the door and just couldn't have been any better. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Uh, Mike, you're up and uh, Matt Miyako, you'll be next. Yes, John, it is nice to uh, talk to you and not ask for your reaction on how you got robbed <laughs> as, as we had the last nine years or whatever it was. Um, as a safety position, you as a player and uh, how that position it has changed, if it has, uh, as you look at them on film as a GM. Yeah, so... Um, you know, I think that is one thing that's extremely gratifying to see that there's been a movement, um, and I, I think a, a, a well-needed one that speaks to the value of that position, because for years, you know, that was a, safeties were facing an uphill battle getting into the hall, and I, I you know, I, I feel like I've lived it, but don't, don't know verbatim the, uh, the, um, you know, kind of how we started knocking down the door, but a number of safeties have gone in. I think Brian Dawkins, Troy Palomalu, Steve Atwater, uh, Kenny Houston at some point went in. I mean, the, the list is long here in recent years. And I think that's, I think it's appropriate because I think that position really has an impact on, on football. And I, the reason being, because you're asked to do a little bit of everything. And so you can get very involved in a game. Your coordinators can move you around and find ways, and it's it's tough to deal with um, if you have a player who can do the, the the multiple things you have to be able to do at those positions. Having said that, you know everything in football cyclical. Mike, when I first came in, there were a lot of safeties that kind of looked like me, 220 pound, bigger thumpers that dealt with big running backs. Um, I think clearly now, and uh, you know the guy we have in. In San Francisco, Jimmy Ward is a great illustration, a guy who has cornerback skills, 
who can get down covered tight ends, but can also line up in the slot against receivers. Justin Simmons in Denver is another example, a guy who's got enough size um, to mix it up and play physically, but also can hold up in coverage. Um, I did a lot of that throughout my career, but I wasn't asked to, to cover receivers, you know, in the slot. We played a lot of, you know, too deep and, and I had my half of the field. Um, but in, in terms of man to man. So I think we're going through a cycle right now with all the passing in the game where um, it, that position will always, I think, um, require a skill set to be able to do a multiple multitude of things. I think it's why I love the position. Um, and I remember having early conversations with Tony Dungy and talking about the way they were going to play me and the vision they had for me. And it was at times you're going to be a D lineman coming off the edge at other times you're going to be a linebacker in the box, reading guards and, and playing, having run fits in the run game. At other times, we're going to blitz you and, uh, you know, with an emphasis on blowing up the, the run game or, or getting to the quarterback. And other times you're going to be back in coverage. And so I love the challenge of it, but, and there will always be cycles, but that's, uh, I think versatility will always be one that is kind of the hallmark of that position because you are at different times asked to do a little bit of everything. Thanks, John. Matt, you're up, and uh, Brandon will be next. Hey, John. Uh, I have two questions for you. They're kind of related, but I want to split them up. Um, first off, not to put you on the spot, but uh, the incident involving Richard Sherman, um, any, what are your thoughts on, on, on that, and, and are the 49ers doing anything as an organization um, to help Richard through this time? Yeah, so, you know, First of all, I, I was in the country. I got uh, back in. We were we were on a on a trip as a family over in um, in Africa and Tanzania, actually doing safari, and could, got back to that news. I, I put my phone away for a little bit, and so obviously not the news you want to hear. Surprised, certainly, um, but most of all, just just concern and and uh, you know for the family, for everyone involved. Um, uh, obviously, you know, reached out to. The family, uh, to Richard, to, to Ashley, and just uh, let them know that we, we want to be a resource for them. We do for all our players, um, you know, both current and and former. And uh, more than that, more than anything, just just praying for them. Uh, they're good people, and uh, you know, um, just praying that uh, that they find their way through this, and we'll support them any way we can. I, I can only imagine kind of the ups and downs that, that players go through. And especially for you, you know, someone who played such a long time in the league, um, had, did, have your experiences as a player and kind of being in those shoes, has it shaped you as a general manager on how you handle, uh, you know, interpersonal relations with players? I think it gives me great perspective and maybe a little bit of credibility in their eyes because I've been in their shoes. Um, I've lived that and, uh, you know, I know that that, um, you know, not not that uh, I think Sherm's got, you know, uh, play left in him, but I know the transition when you're coming to the end. I don't care how prepared people might think you are. It's a difficult one. And, uh, I, you know, people struggle with that for for a variety of reasons, but it, it's difficult. And, um, you know, people go through it. So I, th I think, though, having played, obviously, I've, I've been there and. That sometimes there's something that you, you just don't understand unless you've been in those shoes. And so um, I, I do think I'm not speaking directly to that situation, but in general, Matt, I do believe that it, that that is a huge plus is that um, they know when I'm telling them something, it's, I'm not just speaking out of, uh, out of uh, pulling things out of a hat. It's, it's something I've lived. And so I do think that's helpful in, 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 um, in a bunch of different situations. Thank you, John. And see you soon. Thank you, Matt. All right, Brandon, and then uh, next would be Andrew Mason. Hey, John, good to see you and congrats. Uh, I guess I'm gonna kind of roll two or three questions into one. How cool is it that you're going in with Atwater? You mentioned the growth of safeties or the influx of safeties in recent years and, and Palomalu, and that means a lot of Broncos fans will be there because you and Peyton obviously mean a lot to the Broncos, but Atwater was you know, a 10-year Bronco or nine-year Bronco. So that'll ensure there's so much orange and blue in Canton. And then secondly, how much has your life changed? Because you've got a pretty busy day job, so you may not get to travel around as much or, you know, be out and about as much as other guys who, who don't have as demanding a gig. So how much has it changed since you found out that you were all a family? 
Uh, good questions. Um, first of all, starting with Steve, um, BK, you know, and everybody, anyone who's been around him, I mean, he was fierce on the field. I, I feel like I have a lot in common with him because he was fierce and physical on the field and not someone you wanted to mess with, someone I admired greatly. Um, but he's one of the, the, the sweetest, kindest people you'll ever meet off the field. And, um, you know, I, I, I haven't known Steve for a long, long time, but, uh, you know, I think our friendship has gotten closer and closer of late. I was pulling for him. He was pulling for me. And I mean that in the most genuine sense. And we knew that. And so I'm thrilled for him. I'm thrilled for his family. And even, you know, he's in the, he's in the, uh, the class of 20, I'm in 21, but you know, as, as, uh, I guess I'll get to experience moving forward here with Canton. Uh, once you're in that club, you're in that club and it's, uh, it's, it's pretty special. And, uh, you know, I, I, I mean that, I mean, I'm getting chills right now thinking about Steve Atwood. I remember early in my career, Herm Edwards, um, give me the old VHS tape. It wasn't, you know, the digital stuff. Hey, throw this up on your computer. Give me a VHS tape when he and Tony first arrived and saying, Hey, study Steve, because I think you have a lot of components of your game that are similar. And, um, I, I think the world of him as a player, I think the world of him as a human being, I'm so, so happy for him. I think, uh, he deserves to be there and yeah, it, it is special. I think, uh, you know, particularly that 21 class, you mentioned, somebody mentioned to coach Flores earlier, you, you get a bond with that class that's already developed. We have a text chain that's fun and, um, and, uh, you know, it's really special, but there is something about we're all going to be there together. It'll be a busy weekend, but um, I think there will forever be a connection of the people you went in with. And then, yes, I'm busy with my job, but uh, the Niners have been great. And, um, you know, this is something I'm going to enjoy. Um, work long and hard for it. It's taken a while that, um, you know, I'll. I'll, uh, I'll work right to the Thursday where I take off. And I thought about skipping and going in just for Sunday, but um, you know, Kyle was very helpful there, man. You, you work long and hard for this. You go enjoy the entire thing. And so that's why you have a great team and people will hold down the fort when I'm, when I'm gone. But uh, you know, I, I, I say in that video when David showed up and I, I really had um, kind of hardened myself because it had taken some time that, oh, you know what, this really doesn't matter. It's not going to change my life. And I truly believe that, but it does change your life when you get that news because you're, and I, I think the most poignant thing when David said you're number 350 and to think of all the people that try to play in this league that started playing Pop Warner and then you go to high school and then to college and then you get to the NFL and you're just, in my case, just, just trying to contribute on a team and, and um, you know, it's given you uh, a, uh, so, so many times I think when you're, when you're in life and you're, you're, everything's about going forward. What's next, what's next, what's next. Like retirement briefly did before I moved on to other things, this gives you an, an ample opportunity to look back and think of all the people you're grateful for. Think of all the people that played a role, your family, your high school coaches, your, your youth football coaches, your parents, and how responsible they are. And, and to, to think you're in that unique of a, of a club. Um, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I guess it is life changing. Thanks, John. See you soon. Thank you. All right, Andrew, you're up. And then next would be uh, D. Orlando Ledbetter. John, good to see you as always. And congratulations again. Richly deserved. I'm sure you've done a lot of reflecting on your career, the people and events that made it possible, and putting together your speech and that sort of thing. So when you look back, what were some of the important junctures that made being a Hall of Famer possible that perhaps most people don't know about? Yeah, um, you know, it's something that I'll, I'll allude to a lot in my speech. I think the belief that other people had in it because you can't do this alone. And so it starts with, I think for me, with my with my parents and, and just the belief, they always taught me to, to dream big and believe in yourself and anything you do to give it, give it your all. And so I, you know, you start with that premise. Um, you know, Linda was with me my entire career and, and the belief she had in me and the support she, she gave me, um, uh, you know, coaches along the way, teammates. And I think there's a theme of, you know, um, life is hard, life is difficult, you know, and, and the NFL certainly is, and you're going to get knocked down and it takes a, a lot of people believe in you sometimes more than you believe in yourself. And, and so I think I, I've spent a lot of time reflecting on that and being incredibly grat uh, grateful for, you know, whether it's, 
it's teammates. Um, and you know, with the, I, I think that the hall's doing the right thing with these six to eight minute speeches, but it's hard to get all the people that have that played a role. And so, um, you know, but I, I certainly have spent time thinking about, you know, just about anybody that could have played a played and, you know, had some sort of responsibility for that. And I, I truly genuinely am, am grateful and, and know that you don't get here on your own. There's a lot of people responsible for it. And, um, you know, very, gr very grateful for, for so many people who played a role in it. Awesome. Thanks, John. Thank you. Uh, next is one of the Hall's esteemed selectors, uh, Mr. Ledbetter, and after that will be Ray Lee. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, John, um, could you share with the um, the media here th those battles in the old NFC North and how you all were able to, you know, establish Tampa Bay as a powerhouse uh, coming up through uh, those old division uh, battles? And, and what was it like going to Denver and, you know, carrying on your career? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think too when uh, Orlando and I think when I when I first got to the Bucks, I was playing. I, I really date myself when I think. I mean, I was teammates with guys like Steve DeBerg, Anthony Munoz was on my first team, Jerry Gray, um, you know. And I, I think about that division, you know, and where we were as a team with the Bucks, we weren't very good. Uh, my first, I, I, I went through a. I, I was thinking back, my first preseason game was against John Elway. Then we played against Jim Kelly and Dan Marino. And then I line up in my very first game of my career, and it's Joe Montana playing for the Kansas City Chiefs in 93. Um, but I think back to those that the old black and blue division, you know, with the, the Minnesota Vikings and, and, and uh, those battles we had with them as we started ascending as a team. I think of Detroit, and when you think of Detroit, I think of one person. I think of nightmares and, and Barry Sanders. <laughs> there was obviously a lot, you know. And I, and, and then you, you spend a little more time, and you realize it was a lot more than just Barry. There were people like Herman Moore and Johnny Morton and uh, Chris Calloway. I mean, there's some great players on those teams. And David Sloan was a tight end that was very underrated. And you know, Scott Mitchell, but Barry was the one guy who occupied, I mean, he, he was kind at one point saying I occupy, occupied a place in his mind. He still occupies a place in my mind that, um, you know, people ask, do you have flashbacks? Do you have nightmares? And, and I think thinking about this has caused it. Barry seems to be at the root of a lot of those. Uh, the Green Bay teams, you know, that, that, be, uh, that were so well put together. Um, and, you know, I remember vividly playing at a place that just felt like football was supposed to be played there in Green Bay and, and Reggie White, you know, up on singing Amazing Grace and trying to, I was, you know, first, my first interaction with him was as a personal protector on the punt team and they would align him in the A gap and he was my, my job to, to block. And one time he, you know, he did the forklift, lifted me up, dumped me and then, and then picked me up and said, God bless you, son. You know, and, and that was Reggie um, and Brett Favre watching him ascend into his career. Um, those were great times. And, and um, you know, um, that division was so good. And then we moved over to the NASCAR division, you know, uh, as, as we called it with Carolina and Atlanta and uh, really some great rivalries in there. And by then we had started to become a pretty good football team. So um, tremendous memories there, you know, 11 years in Tampa. And then, you know, always, I, I was an idealist. I, I always wanted to play my career in one spot, but things, things happened. And, and I left Tampa after year 11, I had a lot of great choices, chose Denver and, uh, just, you know, I, I alluded to that a little before, and it was just a tremendous landing spot, came a place that was great to our family, uh, on the field, off the field with our, our charitable endeavors. The, the folks in Denver just uh, really um, supported us and, and made it feel like home. And where, when you, you, you think going in, it's going to be hard to find a place that is like Tampa because uh, the people had supported me so much. But quickly, I learned that Denver was a special fan base. And, uh, you know, I, I remember, you know, when we when I when we first arrived there, Champ and myself arrived in 04 and, you know, we had the upper hand on the on the, you know, like the Chargers and um, but then quickly watching that San Diego roster become one of the most talented I've ever seen. I mean, you go down that that list of the Chargers, they had, you know, Breeze and Rivers backing them up and Antonio Gates, Marcus McNeil, Nick Hardwick at center, Chris Steelman at guard, Lorenzo Neal at 
fullback, uh, LT running back. His backups, by the way, were, were Michael Turner and Darren Sproles. I mean, that, that roster, kudos to, to AJ and Marty Schottenheimer for building it. And, uh, you know, I, uh, it, it's uh, watching that team evolve and the, the you know, it's a, it's a shame they never won one. Cause that's, that's one of the most talented rosters I've ever seen. And the Kansas city chiefs, those matchups with Denver and KC, it seemed like whoever was home won that one. Um, great times and great memories. Um, and it, it's been a tremendous ride. There's no doubt about that. Thanks for sharing those recollections. Thank you. Ray Lee, you're up and after her will be Zach Stevens. Hi, John. Ray Lee here with KDWN 101.5 FM, 720 AM, the talk of Las Vegas. Congratulations on this achievement. Um, my question for you is, in playing a successful 15-year career and then going into management for the 49ers, how do you think your time as a pro footballer impacted your ability to successfully manage an NFL team? Yeah, so Ray Lee, I think we're all in whatever we do in life, we're a product of our experiences. And, and one of the things I was blessed with is I was exposed to some trend tremendous, tremendous people from the time growing up with my parents and the, the lessons they instilled in me. Um, I'll fast forward to college. I played for Denny Green. I was part of his first recruiting class at Stanford. And, uh, you know, I remember him talking me into, I, I had some ni nice options, uh, Notre Dame and SC and UCLA and all these other options. Um, and uh, Denny did an incredible recruiting job and talking about his vision. He was a first year head coach at Stanford. I was a quarterback then. And, and uh, you know, he talked me into to, to go into Stanford and thank God for that. I'm, I'll forever be grateful for that. Um, I played football and baseball at Stanford and kind of thought baseball was where I was going. And then along came Bill Walsh and Bill Walsh really believed in me as a player, talked me into coming back my senior year and everything kind of took off there. Um, but the theme I'm talking about is the, the great people that I was exposed to. And you go to the NFL, Sam Weiss, who was a Bill Walsh disciple, moving on to Tony Dungy, John Gruden. Uh, then I go play for Mike Shanahan, had three weeks at the end with Bill Belichick. I, I was exposed to a lot of great minds and a lot of great people. Uh, you know, I haven't even mentioned any of the assistants like Herm Edwards, Lovey Smith, Rod Marinelli, uh, Mike Tomlin. Uh, you know, these are people I was exposed to. So I think that leaves an imprint print. And you take a, you take a little bit of the, the experience, the knowledge from all of those people. Um, you know, my dad always taught me, you want to be successful, study successful people. And I always took notes and, and uh, tried, to, tried to listen in. I never knew that I'd be doing this. But I think um, by osmosis, you kind of take that in. And I think to, I think back to now, a lot of the way I do things, a lot of the way Kyle does things, we're, we're all a product, a product of our experiences. And I was exposed to some tremendous people, some tremendous leaders. And um, I try to implement that into everything that I do. And, um, you know, run, running the football uh, for the 49ers is no different. Well, great. And you're doing an awesome job at it. So thanks so much for that. Um, and congrats again. Thank you. Zach Stevens and then George Stroyan. Hey, John, thanks for talking with us today and congratulations. And you've pretty much done it all when it comes to the game of football. You've played, you've been a broadcaster and now obviously a GM. Which one's been your favorite? <laughs> uh, I think all of them at the time. I've, I've always, I think one of my my greatest skills. I have a, I have a, um, a good ability to kind of live in the moment. And so, um, you know, whatever's, whatever's right there, I'm, I'm very invested in, um, you know, I, I, uh, you know, and I think people sometimes struggle to believe that, that, uh, you know, wait, you're having as much fun being a GM as you did when you played. It's different, but yes, I, I think, uh, I, I will say that I think that, the, the challenge of being a GM, just the, the multitude of things that come by your desk that come, come to you each and every day. Um, you know, I, I think maybe, uh, I was, I was built and raised to, to play ball. And, and, uh, you know, I, I think what I, what you know now that I probably didn't understand as much as everybody in these, uh, in the, the, the front offices, the staffs of these football teams was a lot smaller when I was playing, but everything is, is done with an effort of, of simplifying things so that when you send it to the players, their life's easier. And so, uh, you, you know, I, I think 
all, all players probably don't have a, as much of an idea of how many people are trying to do things just to make, to set them up for success. And now I'm on that side and trying to build something great. I love being a part of that. And so I think whatever I'm invested in, I, I think the, the key theme is football. And I, I love everything about the game. I really do. And I've been blessed to, to see it from a variety of perspectives and a variety of uh, different roles. And, and um, you know, don't plan on going anywhere any, any soon. And being a part of this family now is a new one that I get to experience it with, with the Hall of Fame. And so looking forward to this this uh, this weekend in Canton and to uh, to um, to do it and, and, you know, putting the finishing touches on a speech and trying to get under eight minutes and <laughs> all those challenges that come with it, but they're all fun. And, and I'm very blessed to be able to experience it. We're winding down here on the time that, uh, that uh, John has been so gracious to grant us. So we will get a couple more questions in do apologize to all of you who, who do have your hand raised and, and we won't get to you. So apologize for that, but that's uh, the way it goes sometimes. Uh, let's go to George Stroya and then Aaron Harris. Hey, John, congratulations. Um, you've, you've sort of answered this a little bit throughout the Zoom today, but um, you, you're one of quite a few great players to end up finishing their career in Denver and, and sort of choosing that. Um, you're, yourself, you know, Ty Law, Brian Dawkins, uh, Peyton, obviously. Uh, there's a certain quarterback out there right now that um, is maybe considering wanting to finish out in Denver. Um, that we all know about. So I'm just wondering, what is it about Denver and maybe the Broncos organization uh, that you think maybe, you know, more veteran players want to finish their career at? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I can speak from, from myself. I, I think at the time, very, very much like the Niners there, you just knew with, with Mike and uh, at the helm and, and I think even more so Pat Bolin as the owner, um, you know, I talk about it a lot, but all you want as a player, you want a chance, you know, and I think there's some organizations where you know you're going to have that if you join them. And when I was playing, that was always the case that you had a chance when you went to the Denver Broncos, they were going to do everything possible. Uh, their actions represented that it wasn't just talk, their actions represented them competing for a championship. That's what Pat Bolin, I quickly learned. That's what made him go. Um, the, the competitive spirit of, of wanting to compete for a championship each and every year. And so those things travel. I think Colorado is a, is a beautiful place to live. There's so much to offer. Um, you know, with the mountains, the people are extremely active. Uh, the fan base, much like our Niner fan base, is, is very regional. It's not just the people in Denver. When you travel, I don't know who's responsible. I think somebody who wore number seven is probably, uh, you know, fairly responsible for that, as are a lot of those championship, um, you know, those guys who, who won championships. But when you travel, people meet you at your bus. They're at your hotel. It's a very regional fan base, national fan base. Um, there's a lot that the, that organization has to offer. And uh, those, you know, things like that travel in the, in players circles, uh, you know, that, Hey, you'd love living there. You'd love playing there. The organization does things right. So that's the best answer I can give you there. And uh, on, on, on why Denver was special. Thanks, John. Thank you. Next, uh, Aaron Harris, and then uh, Jacob Meadows. Hey, John, thanks for your time. When you were with the Buccaneers, you had a lot of memorable games against the greatest show on turf and a lot of success, too. And I'm curious as to how or why your defense was able to match up so successfully with their offense. Well, first of all, it starts with players always. We, we had some pretty good players. We're, we're starting to get a, a, a nice representation in Canton, but it started with the guy up front, um, Warren Sapp. You know, he made it all kind of go in our defense and – uh, you know, he's, he's one of the best players in my mind ever to play the game. He, he, he had to be accounted for on each and every play, or he would just really ruin your, your game plan. Derek Brooks, uh, was, was, was so good and uh, so impactful and did so many things for us. Uh, you know, there was a lot more to that. We, we played with an attitude. We, we, you know, I, I think our, our scheme was incredibly sound, uh, we didn't try to do too much, but what that created was we knew our jobs inside and out and we could play full speed. I think we were built on speed. Um, we were smaller than most, but um, we, we did things with, with, with 
tremendous conviction and, and uh, we were fast. And, and so I think it was speed versus speed. They did things very fast and they attacked you. They, they came after your weak spot. We tried to do the same. And as a result, we had great matchups. And I think the, I mean, that rivalry that became, I mean, they're, I think of the championship game, um, you talk about things, the, the one that got away that, that Ricky pro play, uh, I saw a trailer for, for Kurt, Kurt's new, uh, what, what do they call that biopic or his new movie on his life story. And one of the, <laughs> one of the things in like an animation was that, that perfect throw he threw to Ricky pro, who, who I don't believe that scored a, a touchdown over 20 yards or something all year long. And he got us on that one. Couldn't have been a better throw. Um, that's one that will always stick, but there were low scoring games like that. Then we played shootouts against them, but they were always going to be a great game. They had hall of fame players. We had hall of fame players um, and incredibly competitive people. And it just made for, for a great match. They, we were built on our defense. They were built on their offense. Uh, talked about the speed. That's how they were built. They had night. They had fun personalities that, that um, not only played, but, but, you know, uh, I think talked in a, in a good way. Uh, they had great competitors. I mean, Marshall, uh, Marshall and I are very close friends, but man, we had a rivalry and we talked a lot on the field, but it was always out of respect. So we had great respect for each other, but we wanted to beat each other in a bad way because uh, uh, I think they were known as the best on offense at the time. And we were, you know, many years known as the best on defense. And so those, those, that rivalry has so many great memories in, in, uh, in my mind, that 99 game, not being one of them. <laughs> Thank you. And congratulations. Thank you. We've got time for two more questions and it's going to go to a Jacob Meadows and then Alex Fleming. Hey, good afternoon, Mr. Lynch. This is Jacob Meadows with KDWN 720 AM Las Vegas. Um, Looking back on your illustrious career, you know, between the Bucks and the Broncos, you dealt with a whole, whole lot. But over the last half a decade or so, uh, leading up to now, you, uh, you're you one of the best. I and mean, you're staring down the barrel of being one of the best GMs in terms of player and team development. Looking back at your illustrious career and everything that you accomplished throughout your actual career as a player, uh, is there anything that stands out among other things that has led to you being so great at player and team development from hiring Kyle Shanahan, one of the greatest offensive minds in the game to just overall being able to do what you've done with the 49ers organization. Well, I appreciate your kind words, but you know, I I'd say I've got a long way to go uh, to, to reach kind of the, the levels you're talking about. Got to, got to win a, a championship and then hopefully build some, we are proud of what we've built. Um, you know, I came in with Kyle, didn't hire him. We came in together. Um, you know, I, I, I do think I, I know people who know football, who I believe in and, and something, you know, um, you know, I, I, the draw was the organization and the opportunity to work with someone like Kyle, who we kind of jived. We, we saw football in a very similar light. And so um, he would tell you the same thing. We've, we've got, we've got some work to do. We, we believe very much in our team, but uh you got to win championships to be, to be known, you know, for, um, to, to, to build a legacy. And we understand that. And we're at an organization where that's very much the, uh, the expectation and, uh, the history, um, you know, we walk by Lombardi's every day. And so that's what we're shooting for. Um, I think, uh, you know, anything I do well, I, I mentioned earlier, being a product of my experiences. And then, you know, one thing I'll, be eternally grateful. My parents, you know, instilled a tremendous work work ethic in, in me and my siblings and anything we did, we were expected to do um, to the highest degree of effort. That's what you can control. And I've always believed in that. And, uh, um, you know, I, I believe very much in the, in the, uh, the idea of working together as a team, empowering people, surrounding yourself with, with talented people and empowering them to do their work. And so uh, anything I've been able to do, it's for those reasons. And uh, that's it. That's awesome. Thank you very much, man. Hey, go 49ers Nation. You were a hero to me growing up. Thank you for taking the time to answer the question. Thank you. John, we thank you for all the time you've taken to answer all these questions. We're going to let Alex Fleming from the Florida Sun have the last one, and, and here you go. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Lynch, Alex Fleming, Florida Sun, first and foremost, go Bucks. Um, <laughs> it was easy to say that you're one of the top 10 power hitters of all time. 
But with that being said, how did you keep your mental health about you? And how difficult is it to manage CTE in an era where you really can't hit a defenseless receiver? Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I think uh, the answer, Alex, you know, I guess I was known for my physical style of, of, of play. I think the game probably was much more set up for that. It's still incredibly physical. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I did my best uh, to play to play physically, you know, I was taught by great ones like Ronnie Lott that that's your area and you establish it as that. And, uh, you know, I was also taught that you do it within the confines of the rules. And I always took great pride in doing that. And so, um, you know, I, yeah, there's been some evolution to the rules where things that we did then probably aren't, aren't, aren't going to fly now. And, um, you know, I think I would have adjusted like anyone else. I've been blessed that I'm in good health. Um, something I worked incredibly hard to always condition my body, my mind, uh, kind of took a holistic approach to training. And, uh, you know, and I think the good Lord kind of built my body to be able to play this game. And uh, I feel incredibly healthy. I never take that for granted. I work hard at doing things to keep my mind always active. I think like anything else, you, you train your brain just like you do the rest of your body. And, um, you know, I, I'm cognizant of what I, what I did for a, a long period of time. So I'm always focused on that. And uh, I've been very blessed. And, and it's something important uh, to me that, you know, with our players, that we give them every opportunity to stay healthy both physically and mentally. And, and um, you know, I, that, that's the way I approached it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Alex. John, on behalf of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, we say we're very grateful that the wait for you is over. And uh, three weeks from today, we look forward to introducing you on the field for the Hall of Fame game. And glad to hear you're gonna take part in all the activities that weekend. You won't regret the time. It, it'll be uh, a, a lifetime of memories. And thank you very much.